uh, the introduction missed to mention that I have been teaching for one cell also in Taiwan and I've made three courses three months I have worked and taught also in Macau as a guest uh, lecturer and uh, my topic for today is the 2008 global financial crisis the world went into a major economic crisis they call it the great recession uh, millions or tens of millions of people lost their jobs thousands of businesses went bankrupt a lot of financial institutions went bankrupt a lot of homeowners lost their houses so it was a major economic event known as the Great Recession which is supposedly the second worst recession over the last 100 years it is still ongoing on and lingers today and I may actually discuss that we are now preparing the world for another <coughs> even major even worse recession coming down the road but I hope I'll be able to explain why my focus for today is for the causes what really caused the depression or the recession of 2008 the main reason is that media tells us stories which are false which are not true we call this propaganda propaganda tells us what the governments want us to hear I'll tell you basic economics hopefully that first and second year students are able to understand so my focus is on the alternative causes and a short overview of what I'll do today is give you some background information I did a little bit tell you about the root causes which are very easy to understand and then we need to look at the fundamental causes later on we discuss the topic of who is to blame whose fault it is someone is at fault they tell us oh it's the free market that failed for example or it's greed and greedy bankers well we've had free markets for a long time we've had greedy bankers ever since the introduction of banking for thousands of years bankers are greedy greed does not cause economic crisis and a little bit of is there another crisis coming now and then a <coughs> short conclusion I hope to spend about 50 or so minutes in about 20 slides and then uh, give you the chance for some questions maybe you have some questions important possibly we can also interrupt midway through okay so what's the background the background is actually very simple during the 90s and the late 90s I guess about the time you were born uh, there was a major dot-com telecom bubble this was the bubble of the internet it was the bubble of communications that's when the internet became popularized that's when everyone got online you had many companies and those companies grew fast and they grew fast with a lot of debt everyone was investing in internet companies everyone was investing in software everyone was investing in telecommunications company it was a huge boom that grew into a major bubble a bubble simply means that the sector is much much larger than the economy needs and a bubble means that eventually when it bursts it becomes a major crisis it has the power to collapse the whole economy to collapse the banking system to collapse most of the economy to the point where most people would lose their jobs so as the bubble burst the US government made the decision instead of taking the consequences to institute a policy that will 
mitigate, meaning make the problem easier by creating a much bigger, much worse problem. So, as the bubble burst, the recession of 2001 and 2002 came. It was supposed to be a horrible recession, but the US government intervened by printing a lot of money. We call this easy monetary policy. It happens by lowering interest rates extremely low. Everybody borrows. In other words, the economy runs on borrowing and debt. And the biggest borrower was the US government. So the government borrowed, consumers borrowed, businesses and corporations borrowed, everybody borrowed and everyone was getting in debt fast. So that's the Fed response, lower interest rate and the result was the lowest interest rates in US history. Now, even later, I'm making an interjection, is we have the lowest interest rates of recorded history. Over the last 2,000 years, we have the lowest interest rates in recorded history. This, we are told, is something good, but the reality is that this has terrible consequences. So, the result was massive borrowing and massive real estate bubble. Everyone was borrowing money, everyone was investing in real estate. The US economy built a giant real estate bubble. And so did Europe. Almost every European country had a giant real estate bubble. And so did most of Asia, except for Japan. Uh, Hong Kong, a huge bubble. Singapore, a huge bubble. Thailand, big bubble. Pretty much most of the world grew a major real estate bubble out of the ultra low interest rates in the United States and therefore low interest rates all over the world. So the result of that was the global financial crisis of 2008. That's the short background information which I could possibly produce within five minutes. So what are media and politicians tell us? They tell us that it was caused by greed. But wait a minute, people today now are greedy. People yesterday were greedy. A year ago people were greedy. Ten years ago people were greedy. 50, 100, 200, 300 years ago, people are always greedy. Greed is part of human nature. Greed makes people do things, yes, but it's not greed that drives economic and financial crisis. People always want to have a house, always. Every culture, every civilization, British people say that my house is my castle. Bulgarians are crazy about real estate. Russians are crazy about real estate. Americans are crazy about real estate. Of course, Singaporeans and Hong Kong and Thai people are crazy. Everyone wants a house. It's not greed that makes the bubble. It's credit. Second, they say it's caused by the failure of free market. Well, that's also patently false. We've had in history before a lot of free markets and definitely free markets don't cause bubbles. Again, it's the same fundamental understanding. Bubbles are caused by borrowing and debt. Somebody allows the policy of, bo uh, of borrowing and debt. Free markets just don't cause bubbles, okay? That's, you need to understand. Otherwise, you'd get be in a bubble almost all the time, okay? It's caused by market 
failure. Somehow we're being told that the market failed to regulate or the market failed to self-regulate. That's also, and I'll explain a little later why, what just markets didn't fail. Something else failed. And that something else, of course, is monetary policy, fiscal policy, government regulations that failed. Again, that's part three. That's what I'm going to be explaining. Caused by human psychology. But as I explained also in part one, people, psychology is always driven to prefer houses. Human psychology doesn't make bubbles. Human psychology doesn't make banks to collapse. It's something else. It's an easy explanation, but it's not truthful, okay? You have to make a difference between what is easy to tell the people and what is actually true. And finally, we're told that it's caused by banks. And the answer is, yes, it is true. The banks contributed. They were a major participant. But it's not simply the banks themselves. Yes, they have a role, they have a part, okay, but they're not the main contributors. They're not the main cause. They're not the primary cause. So, what usually causes bubbles, we study in economics, in financial economics, there is a subject. And the more you study bubbles throughout history, we got recorded bubbles even for 2,000 years. It's not a new phenomenon. It's basically very simple. It's credit expansion. Credit expansion means that banks provide more credit than the economy needs. A different way of saying is that banks provide credit at a faster rate than the economy. The economy grows at 15%, but banks grow credit at let's say, sorry, the economy grows at 5% and banks grow credit at 15%. Or let's take the example today of China. China or Chinese economy supposedly grows at 10%, but banks grow credit at 20%. The result is the economy grows slowly and the banking and the credit system grows fast. At one point, the banking financial system becomes too big and the economy too small. That's how you get bubbles. So that's the first part. The first part is credit. And the second part is called financial speculation. People borrow to buy real estate and that drives prices. So financial speculation is you buy something to profit. You buy something with the expectation that the price will rise. As a result, of course, as people buy, prices do rise. And as prices rise, people decide and borrow even more money. I see this every day now in Thailand, and maybe you see this here in Korea too. As housing prices go higher and higher, people have to borrow more to buy. And as they borrow more to buy, they buy, they speculate, it goes to higher prices. And again, higher prices, more borrowing, higher prices, more borrowing, higher prices. This is a vicious circle and this is the bubble. As long as the credit flows, in other words, as long as people can and borrow, you will get the bubble. So this is the basics of bubble. It's actually amazingly simple, but it is very seductive. Politicians love it. And bankers love it. Bankers make a lot of money while they are lending. People feel good. It's like a drinking party. Everybody's having good alcohol. Everybody's having a good time. The problem is when it's over, it feels bad. It feels terrible. So that's the background. We use the words credit is the same as debt is the same as leverage. The economic explanation is very simple. 
You could use credit productively or you can use credit non-productively. Productive credit makes phones and shirts and computers and cameras, makes real things for consumption, rice, food, okay? And non-productive credit is credit used for consumption. Non-productive credit or consumption credit is you borrow money to buy a car, you borrow money to buy a house, you borrow money to buy a telephone. Consumption credit would even be considered you borrow money to study, you borrow money to go on vacation. So all of this is consumption credit. You have to understand that consumption credit is not productive. And the other non-productive credit is speculative credit. This is credit. You borrow money and you invest in gold, hoping the price of gold to go up and you make a profit. You borrow money and you invest in stocks, hoping stocks go up and make profit. Or you borrow money and invest in a house, hoping that the house, real estate prices, will go up. This is speculative credit. So, when you see the banking system provide credit, the question is, do you provide the credit for productive purposes, build ships, build cars, or for consumption purposes, okay? Actually, buy the car. There's a big difference whether the lending is for the consumer to buy the car or for the manufacturer to build a car. If this share is relatively large, if the non-productive credit share is large, you are doomed to a major economic crisis. If the share is mostly for productive credit, you will mostly have a good, healthy economic growth. A different way of saying is that productive credit grows healthy economy and non-productive credit grows a sick economy. A lot of non-productive credit makes the economy sick. So, what were then the real causes? Real causes are very simple. The central bank in the United States, the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world kept interest rates extremely low, ultra low. They kept interest rates at 0.25, quarter of a percent. Normal interest rates will be 5 to 8 percent. So they kept interest rates 10 times lower, 20 times lower than normal. When you keep interest rates 20 times lower, interest rate is the cost of money. Interest rate is low interest rate, means money is cheap. A lot of people will borrow. If the cost is 10 times more, sorry, lower, people will be borrowing a lot and use it for consumption, speculation, and everything else. So that's very simple. And the second part is that the lower interest rates actually fueled non-productive credit. That's where the problem is. And non-productive credit eventually becomes bad credit. Bad credit simply means that the borrower can't pay. The borrower borrowed too much and can't pay back. So people in the United States, they borrowed for a house in 2005, 2006, 2007, and by 2008 eight or nine, two, three, four years later, they can't pay anymore. When borrowers can't pay, the bank is in trouble. The bank goes bankrupt. So the real causes are the low interest rates, most of it flowing to real estate and fuel the real estate bubble. So this is the heart and most of the time where I'm going to spend today to explain some of the real causes, some of the fundamental causes. What's the driver? What's really causing things? And I'm going to spend the next maybe 30 minutes or so, that's most of my lecture today, to explain these nine or ten causes like reach for yield. What does it mean to reach for yield and how reach for yield caused the problem? Well, I'll explain what's a yield. What is subprime lending and what is it coming from? What is financial engineering and securitization? This is some advanced finance and I'll try to explain 
in simple terms so that you can understand. What is the maturity mismatch? Again, this is some difficult stuff. I'll try to do my best. Minority lending is easy to understand. Housing policy is easy to understand. Credit ratings are relatively easier to understand. Credit insurance is a little bit more difficult. Bailout policy is easy to understand. And finally, non-punishment is very, very easy to understand. So a lot of this is easy common sense stuff. Some is a little bit trick here. So three and then I'm go three one three two three three and so forth. All right. Reach for yield. Yield means return. Return on an investment. When you put your money in the bank your return which we call interest is also called yield. E yield is what you get on your capital, what you get on your money, what you get from your stocks or from your bonds or from your real estate or from your bank deposit and when the central bank makes interest rate half percent you don't like half percent I don't like half percent nobody in the world wants half percent they want three they want five they want seven so what they will do is they will try to make some other investment hoping to make three, five, seven, or 15 or more percent. So reach for yield basically means that people don't like the government giving you half percent and trying to do other things. You're gonna buy stocks if they pay you 10%. You're gonna buy real estate if you're gonna give you 10%. You're gonna buy gold, you're gonna buy whatever you think will give you five, 10 or more percent, but you're not gonna take the government. So the reach for yield is clearly caused by the central bank and clearly caused by the central bank policy of low interest rates. They were half a percent and at one point 0.25 percent, 0.25, extremely low like nothing. So what is the reach for yield do? Central bank tells you oh you got to do other things. Well number one you start taking more risk. You invest in risky stocks, you invest in risky bonds, you invest in risky businesses, you invest in risky financial instruments, right? Derivatives. You invest in risky, possibly gold. You invest in whatever risky thing will give you, will give you more profit, more return, more yield. Well, it was known back then as the age of risk. So the low interest rates made everybody take all sorts of risks. Okay, so it was time to make risky investments. And part of taking risk is speculation. Speculation you don't really need the second house and the third house, but you buy the third house because you think the price is going to go up and you're going to be able to sell it at a profit. That's speculation. So speculation is purchasing an asset usually with borrowed money because of expectation that the price will go up and you're going to make a profit, meaning a higher yield or a higher return. It also caused financial engineering. Financial engineering is bankers and financiers design new instruments, new ways to sell to investors, to sell to pension funds, to sell to future funds, to sell to anybody. And these have fancy names. Uh, uh, if the uh, auditorium was mostly professors and businesses, I can teach this is asset-backed securities, these are mortgage-backed securities, these are credit default swaps. These are complicated stuff, but the essence is very simple because you can get on your bond only half a percent, which is like nothing. Bankers try to design new instruments which will provide investors with better returns, okay? And they started selling them to funds, pension funds, investment funds, insurance companies, to anybody who would buy them. The reach for yield also caused subprime lending. 
Prime means high quality, good quality. Subprime means below good quality, means poor credit. Subprime is somebody who doesn't have a good credit, who might pay, who might not pay. In other words, subprime means risky, means high risk. And subprime lending basically is high risk lending. In other words, you run out of good borrowers and now you make loans to bad borrowers. Usually subprime is associated with bad borrowers making bad loans. Next one is called maturity mismatch. That's finance and investing term. It's a little tricky but it's actually very simple. You borrow a loan for let's say three months or six months and you invest it for five years or for ten years. You borrow short term and let's say you borrow for six months you buy a house after six months you borrow again for six months and then you borrow again so you keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing every six months and you borrow while you can if you can't borrow you go bankrupt this is maturity mismatch is caused by the fact that you can borrow short term very cheap because that's what the low interest rate and then you invest in long term which gives you more return okay so here is something very simple to understand just a low interest rate policy will cause four or five other things to happen each of which is potentially bad in each of which will potentially lead to the global financial crisis okay caused by or driven by central bank by the American government essentially all right number two that's the risk-taking part so risk-taking part simply means you take risk means risk is higher well Higher risk, if when you invest in a, something that is riskier, it will give you a higher return. If it's low risk, it's 1%. But if it's high risk, it's going to be 10% or hopefully 20%. But high risk means you may get the 10%. You may not get the 10%. You're not sure. It's risky. Okay. The government gives you 1% for sure, but that's not good enough. Okay. So you take more risk, hoping more risk for more return. I already explained the low interest rate by the government created for five years the age of risk. When bankers talk between themselves, and it's even in the media, it's everywhere. If you watch from 10 years ago, people say risk, risk, risk. You got to take risk. The only way to make profit is to take risk. Everything was about risk. Everyone was taking risk. Everyone understood that the only way to make money was to take risk. It created, it's called a culture of risk. Everyone was thinking about risk and everybody was thinking that you gotta take more risk to make more profits. Part of the risk was, of course, subprime lending. And subprime lending, I'll explain, comes in a number of different forms. One of them is just somebody's got a good job but got sick or whatever the problem was, he can't pay, he's a higher risk. Or somebody already has a house loan, has a medical loan, has a car loan, has a few other loans. He's already deep in debt, but you give him one more loan, maybe to buy a telephone, maybe to buy a laptop. Back in the old days, laptops were expensive. People will borrow a good amount of money to buy a laptop, okay? So, subprime lending was more profitable. In businesses, bankers, everyone is driven by profit. If you're a bank and you want to make more profit, you will be lending to a lot of bad borrowers hoping they will repay. Also, the government's interest rate of 0.25%, this is 
one quarter of one percent is like free it's like free money bankers saw the money as free and when they were getting the free money they did all sorts of crazy thing with it they'd lend to anybody anybody who wanted to loan for any kind of stupid stuff they just borrowed the money because the bankers were getting it free so the more you lend the more you make profit and again one of the other problems the bankers took the money when they made a loan they take the profit right away they take a commission right away and they leave the risk to the depositors and to the bondholders and to the stockholders so the banker takes his little share called commission of the loan right away the banker profits immediately and if something goes bad three or ten years down the road they don't worry that far away so risk taking usually means more risk eventually means more bad loans eventually bad loans means banks can't get back their money and eventually they are in trouble means a credit crisis and a credit crisis economic a credit crisis means crisis in the financial system crisis in banks banks don't have money well when banks don't have money suddenly the whole economy is in trouble means an economic crisis number three financial engineering well you can't make a uh, good money on bonds they started to securitize securitize is fairly complicated you get a bunch of different bonds or loans or securities or mortgages you package them all together and you either sell them as one package or you slice them in small pieces and sell them as a piece in other words you take cheese tomato and everything you make it like one giant pizza and then you cut a little slice and you take one slice you take two slices you take one slice you take three slices depending on how much money you have or how much you want to eat well that's what securitization it takes a bunch of different financial instruments you put them all together and then slices them like a pizza and everybody takes as many slices as they like that's securitization and they created credit derivatives these are financial instruments which bet on credit well, what does it mean bet bet is the same as take a risk is the same as gamble it became like a casino and one of the problem is that now you're getting a big giant pizza with all sorts of stuff you don't know what's inside you don't know how much is healthy how much is not healthy how much is good and how much is junk okay so suddenly you get you may get into problem so this securitization idea where I take a whole bunch of loans you package them together slice them and I give you one piece and you one piece and everybody a piece or two or three as much as you can means that this these risky loans suddenly you begin to transfer I give you a little piece of the risk for you and a little for you one for you one for you one for you everybody gets a little bit of the risk this is called risk transfer now I'm the bank I don't hold a big risk all of you hold a little bit of risk so we are spreading the risk well it's the same thing with the pizza if inside the pizza there is a poison something that if you eat it will kill you if I put it on a whole bunch of pizza and you get a little bit of that poison suddenly you're gonna get sick or poisoned you're gonna get sick or poisoned in other words now you spread the risk but when the risk blows up you now you spread the crisis the crisis in America is now in Norway because Norway invested in them now the crisis is in Germany German funds invested in those American security is in England because the British invested in them so suddenly the crisis is spread all around the world and then it also spreads uncertainty you don't know where the problem is 
You bought one security, like you bought a slice of pizza, but you don't know, is it a tomato, is it the bread, is it the cheese? You don't know which piece is poisonous. Here, you bought one security, which is made out of 100 different securities. You don't know which is the bad security. Suddenly, you got a bigger problem. You got an investment, and you don't know how good it is. You don't know how bad it is. We call this uncertainty. And the risk transfer actually encourages more risk taking in a different sense. Oh, I'm the investment bank, I'm the banker, I made all of these housing loans, mortgage loans. Now I take the loans, I package them together and I distribute them to each one of you. Now I don't have any more loans. I can make more loans again package them and now sell them to these guys. When I sell them, again, I can take more, more mortgages and now sell them to these guys. So, what the Wall Street securitization machine did was actually make more loans, package more securities, sell them to a the bunch of Japanese. Take more loans, package them, sell them to the Chinese. Maybe they sold a bunch to the Koreans too, you know. The whole world was buying them. So, securitization and credit derivatives allowed risk to be spread throughout the world. And when the crisis hit, to hit almost the whole world. Number four, maturity mismatch. Maturity means how soon you have to pay. Maturity mismatch means you borrow short, as in short term. You borrow only for three months, or borrow for six months, or borrow for one year, and then you invest long term. So you borrow money for one year from the bank and you buy a house. But of course the house you cannot pay in after one year. You got to borrow after one year again, and then after one year again. Because you borrow, can, you can borrow cheap short term. So you borrow short term and then you invest long term. The return on long term instruments is high, maybe five, maybe seven percent. You borrow short, maybe half percent, maybe one percent. So think about it. You borrow by one percent, you invest in six percent, you pocket a difference of five percent. That's a huge return from one to six. Five return. So you capture that profit and it provides incentive for everybody to borrow short. Everybody borrows short, meaning three months, and after three months, you gotta borrow again and borrow again. We call this refinancing. If you can borrow again, you're okay. If you can't borrow again, you go bankrupt. We call this interest rate risk. If interest rates rise, you got to borrow again at 1%, at 1%, but what if you have to borrow at 5%? Well, you borrow at 5%, if you're getting 4, you're losing money. If you got to borrow at 10% and you're getting 5, you're losing money. So, this works only when interest rates are low. So, here's another simple explanation. They created a system during low interest rates that works only when interest rates are low. If interest rates rise, the system collapses. The whole system breaks down. So it requires continuous refinancing. It also requires every three months you borrow again. You borrow again. This ability to borrow is called liquidity. So liquidity is also required. So it requires that at every point in time you are able to borrow when you need. So now you need two things. You need interest rates to stay low. As long as interest rates stay low, you're okay. And you need liquidity, meaning ability to borrow whenever you need. Now the system becomes vulnerable. If credit stops, most of the system collapses, or if interest rates rise, most of the system collapses. Again, that's number four. 
Number five. Minority lending. Minority lending, you probably don't have this here in Korea. It's probably not available in China, but in America, you got African Americans. These are people with black skin. They're called minority. You got Latinos. These are Mexicans or other people from Latin America, which are a small percentage of the people. You may have immigrants. In other words, these are people of other race, okay, of other culture, and you have to, you know, the government says, oh, we lend to blacks, oh, we're helping poor people, oh, this is good for the community. These are only nice things to say. Oh, it's required by government policy. The government forces the bank, whether they like or not, oh, there's a black person, you gotta lend to that black person. Doesn't matter that he is fat, that he is sick, and that he doesn't have a job. You gotta lend to black people. So that's basically a government policy, okay? And for the lenders, they say it's okay. We'll lend to that people, we're gonna securitize it, we're gonna you know, sell it to the Chinese. So again, that minority lending encouraged a lot of bad lending, a lot of bad loans. And of course, the US government, like most governments in the world, has a housing policy. The government encourages houses. It's a nice if you have a family to have a house, right? Of course it's a nice. We'll just, it's nice to have a BMW, right? It's a nice to have a nice phone, right? It's nice to have things. But government made it policy. And Bush literally said, it's a good thing. But we gotta differentiate between what is good and what is healthy for the economy. In other words, what is good for the people may not be good for the government or for the bank and so on. So, government provided government guarantees. Okay, we're gonna encourage housing. The government will guarantee certain loans to minorities and to poor people. The government provided even lower interest rates to borrow and invest in houses. Again, encouraging more lending, more housing, more borrowing. And the government reduced down payments. You don't need to pay as much. You don't have to pay anything and you can get a brand new house. <coughs> Okay, hopefully you're gonna be able to pay. So, it finances risky borrowers and bad debt. Next one was credit rating agencies and what the credit rating agency was the following. You got the pizza slice and the credit rating agency comes from the government says, your slice is healthy, you can eat it. And then it puts a stamp, your slice is healthy, you can eat it. So what the government credit rating agency do is they stamp approval. They stamp how good the credit is. Well, there's a problem with credit rating agency. The problem is that they are protected by the government. There are only three of them in America. And only three the government has authorized and licensed. And here's the best part. No matter how bad your policy is, no matter how bad your stamp is, no matter how terrible you perform, you're one of the three. You're guaranteed by the government that no matter how terrible you are, you're always gonna make profits. So, they didn't care. They were collecting fees and they were making a stamp of approval, okay? And there was an, one other problem. The bankers paid to the credit rating agency. In other words, the credit rating agency was getting money for good grades. This is exactly the same as if students paid the teacher for the grade. If every student paid money directly to the teacher for their grade, your grade will be only A, because you're not gonna pay money for any other grade. So, the system was protected and distorted by the government, and the system was corrupt at the core. It was a badly designed system that was designed by required by and protected by the government. You had a lot of other private agencies that could not compete because they, the government did not allow their credit ratings. So that was the government. Number eight, 
credit insurance. There were a lot of banks, there were a lot of insurance companies that insured those credit ratings. In other words, one, you got a slice of pizza, one guy says, your pizza is healthy. But another business, another bank says, in case you get poisoned or stomachache, I will pay your hospital bill. I will, you know, you're not going to get poisoned, says the first guy. The second guy says, if you get poisoned, I'll cover uh, your medical bill and I'll compensate you. Okay? So that's credit insurance. Credit insurance means you make a loan. If the loan is bad, we'll pay for the loan. We'll cover your losses. Well, insurance we've had in Europe for 2,000 years. Insurance. Insurance requires capital. If you want to insure, you need to have money. It requires capital. Well, they were not regulated. The bankers themselves, those who made that insurance, rejected the regulation. They didn't like the regulation. They didn't want to have the capital. And they put a pressure politically on the central bank. They put a pressure on regulators. They put a pressure on legislators. And the US government, meaning the Congress, decided not to require capital and not to regulate them. So, it was a big giant party. I can, you know, insure anything and I don't need any money or capital to do the insurance. That's number eight. And number nine, bailout policy. Bailout means if you get in trouble, the government will save you. Uh, if the big bank is about to collapse and there are going to be huge losses, the government will give money to the bank and save it. Well, the government had a bailout policy where if a bank is too big to fail, in other words, if it's going to cause economic problems for the whole country, meaning a systemic risk, the government will save the bank. The government will bail it out. Well, if you're a big bank and you know that no matter how terrible you are, if you get in trouble, the government's going to save you, it just encourages more risk taking. If you're a big bank, you don't care, you know, the government will save you. So it encourages carelessness. And next, it encourages unhealthy growth. The economy grows because the bank provides credit, but these credits are no good. You know, people just buy houses. They're not productive credits. So it actually encourages unhealthy growth. In other words, the economy grows bigger and fatter and sicker. And it's only a matter of time before we get a heart attack. And encourages riskless lending and mergers. And number 10, it's not a cause up front, but it was well known. It is now called, in English, too big to jail. Too big to jail is a big boss, big banker. He's powerful, he's influential, he may be a criminal, you can't get him in jail. He's not going to be punished. So, it's 2015 now, seven years later, we know for sure now Back then, in 2008, we didn't know, but now we know, seven years later, nobody was prosecuted for real. I mean, they made some investigations. Nobody went to jail. No clawback. Clawback means, hey, you ran this bank, the bank went bankrupt, Give the money back. Give your bonuses. Give your salary. They didn't take money from the bankers. So bankers know, I'm not going to lose any money. I can go bankrupt the whole bank. I'm not going to go in jail. Even if I make fraud, okay, I could be a criminal. It's okay. I know I'm not going to get in trouble because I'm big. I'm powerful. Okay, I'm well connected. I'm rich. I'm mega rich. I can, I'm a billionaire. I can buy the whole court. Okay, so the criminals are basically above the law and basically bankers say in finance that crime pays. It pays, it's profitable for a crime. So in summary, these are 10 fundamental reasons that drove more credit, that drove the 
economy. So, for these 10 reasons, simple question is, who's responsible? Whose fault it is? Number one, reach for yield. It's monetary policy. This is the policy by the Federal Reserve, in other words, by the US government monetary policy. Number two, risk taking is also driven and caused by monetary policy, in other words, by the US government. Number three, financial engineering. It was done by the bankers, but it was driven by or caused by the government. The maturity mismatch, again, same thing. Minority lending, that was government policy. And housing policy was again a government policy. Credit rating agencies were protected by the government, although investors had a role. Investors should have known not to trust these credit rating agencies. They should have been smart enough. They were not enough smart. But the cause was by the government. The credit insurance, again the same thing, the government refused to regulate them. The government refused to require credit, to require capital. Bailout policy, of course, was a government uh, policy that was established in 1997 and even before, 98 and even before that. And the non-enforcement is clearly a government failure of the legal system. Uh, and, of course, political culture and so on. So, if you look on the right for who's responsible, it is fairly clear where the responsibility is, who's to blame. Of course, bankers have a little bit of a role here. Of course, investors have a little bit of a role. In other words, everyone participates into this whole thing. But someone sits behind it. Well, what about the next crisis? Well, right now, Europe is in a major crisis. Greece has gone four times into crisis. The Greek problems haven't been solved. Italy is in a major crisis. France is in a major crisis. Still, Portugal and Ireland haven't gotten out of the crisis. So, most of Europe is in serious crisis. The US has re-inflated and now has got another housing bubble which is basically bursting. The United States has blown a student loan bubble which is almost the size of the housing bubble before. The US has now blown an auto loans. In other words, before people were borrowing to buy houses, now people are borrowing to study in college and people are borrowing to buy cars. And of course, corporations are borrowing a lot of money. This is the fastest and the highest borrowing in the history of the United States. And when the corporations bo uh, borrow the money, they use the money to buy back their stock. It's called corporate buyback. Well, now, over the last few months, Australia is getting a little bit in a crisis because Australia provides China with resources and Canada provides China with resources and the Chinese economy itself is slowing down so the Chinese economy begins to hit suppliers of the Chinese like Canada, Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia. I read just recently that the Korean exports of consumer goods like phones and stuff to China have dropped 20% in the last year. So this will eventually hit the Korean economy too. You can't just take a 20% hit in Korean exports to China and not affect the economy. It will eventually. And of course, you got a, it's called the BRICS crisis. You got a major, major, major crisis right now going on in Russia. It's much worse in Brazil. Today, today, over the last few months, the Brazilian economy is in free fall. It's literally collapsing. South Africa is in terrible trouble. Turkey is already, you got a, the stock market collapse and the bond market collapse, the currency collapse, uh, the government pretty much collapsed, the whole country is almost in a revolution state. Indonesian economy is in bad shape again, the 
stock market has collapsed, the currency has collapsed. Oh, okay, I just said about, I forgot to mention, Malaysia is already in serious trouble. Again, it hasn't completely collapsed, but you can see the economy going down, down and down. Indonesia, again, I'm repeating. The Thai economy is fairly vulnerable. So, as you are seeing today, now, meaning the 2015, oh, big chunks of the world economies are going steadily down, okay? And it's just a matter of which one leads and which one follows. So, what's the conclusion? Another minute or two. Well, we're having now the lowest interest rates in history. We have in Europe well over 2,000 years of recorded interest rate history and we have a good indication of the 5,000 year history of interest rates. Today now we know that interest rates are lowest for our 5,000 year of history. Debt is going everywhere up, up and up, accelerating means that debt is growing much faster than the economies including Japan and China and Australia and you name a country, its debt is growing a lot faster, meaning preparing for the next crisis. Governments so far have not fixed the problem. The policy is known as extend and pretend. Whatever the problem is, they just make sure that it doesn't. If you got a big red spot here, just put a makeup. You don't cure the disease. You just put a little white cream and whatever and it doesn't look bad, okay? Uh, it, it, we also say that when you cut yourself deep, they put a little band-aid, okay? But it's not a solution. The government did not address the problem of debt. The government did not reduce the borrowing. All the causes that were there are here, present, now. We say the government did not make any structural, no real changes were made. And none of the causes that caused the previous crisis has been removed. Another way of saying all the causes that you saw, they are operational now, today. Okay? And you got bubbles everywhere. Thailand is a crazy bubble. I've been living there for two years. I lived for four or five months in Macau. Macau is a crazy real estate bubble. You cannot imagine all the malls and all the Rolex watches. They have like, it's a tiny little country. 400 shops selling Rolex watches in Macau. And we already have right now crisis in over 10 countries. So, the overall conclusion that I would make based on studying this field over 10 years is that we have a new global financial and economic crisis partly on the way and coming soon. Well, thank you.